Hi, my name is Jennifer Pierce. I am a social psychologist and a research assistant professor at the University of Michigan in the Department of Anesthesiology. And today I'm going to be talking about the association between trauma and chronic pain. I am currently funded by the National Institute of Mental Health, but I have no other disclosures. So first I want to talk about what pain is. So here's the definition provided by the International Association for the Study of Pain. According to their terminology, pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. But there's additional things that we need to consider. So first, pain is always personal and influenced by many things, including biological, psychological, and social factors. Pain is not the same as neural activity. Self-reported pain should be respected. Pain is usually adaptive, but it can be maladaptive when it becomes chronic. And there are many ways that pain is expressed, not just verbally, but also through behavior. About 20% of adults in the U.S. experience chronic pain, and about 10% have high-impact chronic pain. And the costs of chronic pain are staggering. Upwards of $635 billion was the estimate in 2010. So this is an incredibly important public health problem. Now, as the definition mentioned, pain is a personal experience. There is no clinical test that can show another individual that you are experiencing pain. And pain is multidimensional. It has a sensory component, yes, which is what we typically think of when we think about pain. But it also has this affective motivational component and also a cognitive or evaluative component. So we respond to pain emotionally and we also appraise the pain. We think about the pain. We apply meaning to that pain, and we assume certain consequences to that pain. Now, unfortunately, many painful conditions are treated within a silo. So we may see a particular specialist for certain types of pain, and then that's all that's seen. However, work by a colleague of mine, Andrew Schreff, at the um, University of Michigan in the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center, show that there are certain conditions known as chronic overlapping pain conditions that overlap. So these include conditions like fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, temporal mandibular disorder, urologic chronic pelvic pain syndrome, endometriosis, vulvodynia, chronic low back pain, headache and migraine, and also chronic fatigue syndrome. Now what they did was they looked into individuals' medical records and they looked at the overlap between these different conditions. And many of these conditions are associated with significantly higher odds of also being diagnosed with another one of these conditions. So if you look at this table on the screen right now, those in red have very high odds of also being diagnosed with the other condition. For example, having a diagnosis of vulvodynia was associated with nearly 25 times higher odds of also being diagnosed with urologic chronic pelvic pain. So it seems like we might be missing the boat a little bit when we're thinking about just conditions. Perhaps considering pain conditions is not particularly helpful. Instead, it may be more beneficial to more holistically consider the pain mechanisms. So here's a breakdown of three overarching mechanisms that we typically consider. The first is nociceptive pain. This is caused by inflammation or tissue damage. This pain is well localized and activity of that painful body region will consistently cause pain. The next is neuropathic pain. This is caused by nerve damage or entrapment. This follows the distribution of the nerves and it features certain qualities, like such as numbness or tingling. And of particular interest to me is nosoplastic pain. This is pain that's believed to be driven by the central nervous system or a systemic problem. This pain is widespread and it's accompanied by other symptoms. And this type of pain describes those chronic overlapping pain conditions from that previous slide. It's important to note that pain doesn't necessarily fall into only one of these mechanistic descriptions. More than one of them can be present. What's also interesting is that nosoplastic pain, pain that's driven by these central nervous system processes, oftentimes includes these two dimensions. One that includes what we call space. So this is a dimension that includes problems with sleep, pain severity, affective distress, so depressive or anxiety symptoms, difficulties with cognition, and also difficulties with energy, so fatigue. The other dimension is known as generalized sensory sensitivity. This includes the spread of pain across the body, so you'll have pain in more regions of your body. 
heightened awareness of somatic sensations, things that are happening in your body, and also sensitivity to external stimuli, like light and sound. So bright lights can cause a lot of um, distress and loud sounds can be very bothersome. And these symptoms cluster together and they're strongly associated. So these are two things that really are highlighted in this nosoplastic pain mechanism. So now let's shift our attention to the relationship between interpersonal trauma and pain. But to take a pause, I, I really appreciate these words by two well-known names in the trauma field. The first quote is from Bessel van der Kolk. And he said, a lot of people still think that trauma is something that happens to you. That is a story about the past, but your brain gets changed and you see the world differently and you live in a different body. You live in a different world where you see things differently and you experience differently from other human beings. The second quote is from Vince Felitti, who was a co-author of the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which was a landmark study that showed the association between childhood adversity and chronic health conditions in adulthood. And he said, traumatic events of the earliest years of infancy and childhood are not lost, but like a child's footprints in wet cement are often preserved lifelong. Time does not heal the wounds that occur in those earliest years. Time conceals them. They are not lost, they are embodied. So trauma and pain frequently co-occur. Previous research su suggests that PTSD, which is a specific mental health condition that has stringent criteria for diagnosis, often co-occurs with chronic pain. Research also suggests that symptoms related to PTSD, so things including intrusive memories of the traumatic event, avoidance-related behaviors, negative cognitions and mood, and heightened arousal or reactivity, regardless of meeting the full criteria for PTSD, are strongly associated with pain symptoms. And individuals can experience these symptoms even if the event doesn't qualify as a traumatic event according to these very stringent criteria. So other stressful life events may lead to some of these symptoms because everyone is different and everyone experiences the world differently. When we look at the rates of trauma exposure across pain conditions, we also see high rates of interpersonal trauma. Retrospective reports of um, self-reported abuse, so when we're looking back and we're having people report on their experiences of abuse during childhood, those are associated with pain. Individuals with a pain-related diagnosis are more likely to report a history of abuse compared to healthy controls. In our own work at the Back in Pain Center at the University of Michigan, approximately 15% of patients say that they've experienced physical or sexual abuse. Studies of fibromyalgia and chronic pelvic pain patients suggest that upwards of 60% of patients have experienced abuse. It's also common in patients with chronic back pain. And to flip the script, I really appreciate this work by West and colleagues. They surveyed women who had recently left their abusive partner. They found that only 5.5% of the women reported no pain, and about one-third of the women reported high disability chronic pain. So we have conducted a survey of adult patients at Michigan Medicine. We asked them to complete the Adverse Childhood Experiences Survey. So this survey asks about experiences that individuals have had before the age of 18. And it includes things like abuse, neglect, but also household dysfunction. So witnessing domestic violence, substance use in the home, mental illness in the home, parental separation, um, incarceration. And the measure that we used extended beyond what was done in the original ACEs study. And we also included things like bullying, loneliness, living in a dangerous neighborhood, and poverty. Participants were also asked to report whether they've experienced any body pain that has felt persistent or recurrent for three months or more. And we found that individuals who self-report chronic pain also had higher rates of having experienced every form of childhood adversity, from abuse and neglect to bullying, loneliness, and poverty. This is looking at the same data, but in a slightly different way. So here, we're looking at individuals who reported three or more adverse childhood experiences and individuals who experienced four or more. So we just summed them up. In each group, those who experienced more adversity more often reported chronic pain. However, I want to draw your attention to something important in these last two slides. Many individuals without chronic pain have also experienced adversity. 
And even if an individual has experienced many adverse childhood experiences, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have chronic pain. There are many, many things that we have to consider here, and the relationship is not fixed. So what explains this association? These are two of the most common that are used in, the, in pain research. So the first is called the mutual maintenance model. This essentially proposes that there is a number of common shared characteristics between pain and PTSD that work to maintain the other process, which causes significant overlap in these conditions. The other model is the shared vulnerability model. And this essentially says that perhaps there's an individual characteristic, anxiety sensitivity, which includes things like fear of somatic sensations related to anxiety and fear of losing cognitive control when experiencing anxiety that drives the development and continuation of both conditions. And these models may be relevant in some circumstances for some people. I generally don't think that any model will explain all cases. And it's important to also notice that these models are heavily based on cognitive and affective or emotional components. But there are other models that can be considered when we're looking at the association between trauma and pain. These, however, have not been integrated that much into pain research. Now, I've only included a couple here, but many of these models have a more biological or a social basis. So, for example, um, this biological embedding model, which I really like, suggests the childhood adversity fosters a pro-inflammatory system, which is amplified by the negative social perceptions that can result from childhood adversity. And then on the other side of the screen, the sensory information processing model suggests that traumatic events change the way that the brain processes sensory information, and it highlights numerous brain networks that overlap with those associated with chronic pain. So there's no firm answer as to how and why trauma and pain are connected. This is still an open question, and many of these models will be useful for understanding this association. But let's take a deeper dive into what we know about the impact of trauma. So interpersonal trauma is associated with dysfunction in multiple domains, including affective, social, cognitive, and physical health domains. So for example, interpersonal trauma, including childhood abuse, is associated with lower emotion regulation skills, higher rates of depression and anxiety, and higher post-traumatic stress symptoms. Childhood maltreatment is also associated with impaired social information processing, including a heightened sensitivity to negative emotion in others, and higher hostility. It's also associated with poorer attachment and negative perceptions of relationships. It's also associated with cognitive impairment, such as working memory dysfunction. And finally, it's associated with physical symptoms, including differences in pain and sensory sensitivity, more reported somatic symptoms, so body symptoms, and among adult victims of intimate partner violence, it's also associated with difficulties with sleep. And this is revisiting those domains of functioning that are implicated by the outcomes of interpersonal trauma, specifically during childhood, and those domains of centralized pain that we talked about earlier. There is substantial overlap with these common pain symptoms. Elements within both that space construct, so sleep, pain, affect, cognition, and energy, and generalized sensory sensitivity, so the spread of pain, somatic awareness, awareness of these body symptoms, and also sensitivity to external stimuli, have been seen as consequences of interpersonal trauma. There are some pieces that are missing, so it doesn't include social dysfunction, impaired social information processing, as well as PTSD symptoms. And these might be important characteristics among, among individuals with chronic pain and a history of trauma as well. So here's some of the work that we're doing at the University of Michigan. This work has typically focused on sensory sensitivity and social experiences because I'm really intrigued by this possibility that individuals who have experienced a traumatic event are processing stimuli differently, including social stimuli. And that can have a downstream effect on physiological function. So in this study that's highlighted on the screen, we looked at individuals who are coming in for a total knee arthroplasty. They completed questionnaires as well as pain sensitivity testing prior to the surgery. Based on their questionnaire responses, we created three groups of people. Those who reported no childhood trauma, those who experienced only nonviolent childhood trauma, such as loss of a loved one or illness, and those who experienced violent trauma, specifically physical or sexual abuse. We found that self-reported measures of nosoplastic pain, so remember nosoplastic pain is kind of accompanied by the spread of pain, somatic awareness, and sensory sensitivity, 
showed a graded relationship across trauma groups with individuals with a history of violent trauma reporting the highest scores. One caveat with this is that those who experience violent trauma also just experience more trauma. They have worse experiences across their lives. So we're not sure if this is the type of trauma or if it's just the accumulation of trauma. But it does seem that generalized sensory sensitivity seems to be related to trauma history. But is it important in the context of other trauma-related outcomes when we look at pain? So here in this study, we looked at whether generalized sensory sensitivity, here we combined spread of pain, somatic awareness, and sensory sensitivity, mediated the relationship between trauma and pain sensitivity. So this is kind of looking at whether the impact of trauma on pain sensitivity was through generalized sens sensory sensitivity or some of these other constructs that are important. And we looked at this among individuals with urologic chronic pelvic pain syndrome. Individuals with the condition, they completed self-report questionnaires and also completed pain sensitivity testing. And this testing included looking at pressure pain sensitivity, so applying pressure, looking at how sensitive they were at both the pubic region and the arm. We found that sexual and non-sexual violent trauma was associated with pain sensitivity and that this effect was primarily through its association with generalized sensory sensitivity. And we also found that it was mediated through more recent experiences of trauma, which again shows how individuals who experience adversity during childhood often experience multiple forms of adversity across the lifespan, creating an accumulation of trauma. And of note, affective distress, so these depressive and anxiety symptoms, did not significantly transmit these effects. Going back to our sample of adult Michigan medicine patients, we found that both widespread pain so chronic pain that was spread across four or more sites out of seven body sites, as well as high post-traumatic stress symptoms, independently contributed to self-reported sensory sensitivity, somatic awareness, and hostility in social situations. And high post-traumatic stress symptoms alone was significantly associated with higher perceived rejection and rejection sensitivity. So this heightened sensitivity to internal and external stimuli, as well as perhaps sensitivity to some social experiences, can be explained by both pain profile and also post-traumatic stress symptoms. Both of them are important. As a social psychologist, I'm also really interested in these social experiences and perceptions. And these are underexplored when we think about pain and trauma. So among individuals that are presenting for care at the Back and Pain Center at the University of Michigan, perceived emotional support. So whether individuals feel supported by important people in their life, this partially explained the relationship between a history of childhood abuse and pain-related outcomes. And these outcomes include not only affective distress, so anxiety symptoms and depressive symptoms, but what I wanted to highlight here is that it's also associated with the spread of pain, this widespread pain. And hearkening back to that biological embedding model, childhood abuse may impact how individuals view their social relationships, and this can have a downstream effect on physical and psychological health. So I want to transition here and talk about how traumatic experiences can impact care for individuals who have chronic pain. It's important to first note that individuals with chronic pain often experience some invalidation from pain providers. There's this, you know, talk about medical gaslighting, and it is very common. So in a recent survey of Michigan residents who self-reported chronic pain, about 70% of individuals said that they have felt invalidated by their pain provider. 47% said that it sometimes happens, and 26% said that it often or always happened to them. And this was more often reported by women and individuals who identify as transgender or non-binary. And this is compounded by a history of trauma. So previous research has shown that providers have, they report more difficult relationships with individuals who have experienced trauma. Providers reported several different types of responses with patients who had a trauma history. First, they criticized themselves for not knowing how to respond. So this sample quote from the Green et al. paper, oh God, there's really nothing you can do for them. You just want to leave. Then you can't do that. That's not right. So you've got to do something. They also respond with more negative emotions like frustration and guilt. So a couple of sample quotes, I'm literally standing in her face yelling at her because I'm trying to make her wake up and realize this is not good behavior, you can't do this. And I end up feeling guilty that you feel this way. So you're all conflicted about this patient. You really wanna help them, but you really feel like you can't. 
And they also expressed lack of training to know how to respond. I know that in NP school, we probably had one 15 minute lecture about the laws of who you have to report and what you have to do, and probably not much more than that. But it was never a formal part of the curriculum. But individuals who have experienced trauma, they also report the same. They also feel the strain in this patient provider relationship. In our sample of adult Michigan medicine patients, more adverse childhood experiences were associated with lower trust in providers treating their pain, lower perceptions of emotional support from their providers, and lower patient satisfaction. And individuals who experienced sexual assault in the past year also reported lower trust and lower perceived emotional support. So victims of interpersonal trauma may also respond differently to pain-related treatments. So here we explored self-reported side effects to pain medication among chronic pain patients at the Back and Pain Center. We looked at groups by trauma history, and here we um, divided the groups between no abuse reported, reporting only childhood abuse, reporting adult abuse only, and childhood and adult abuse, so those who experienced it at both developmental time points. This figure on the screen shows the percentage of patients in each group who reported each type of side effect to some type of pain medication. And those asterisks on the screen show where there were differences. So you can see many of the reported side effects showed these group level differences. And the frequencies show that overall, those who reported no abuse showed the lowest frequency of reporting side effects. And those who had a cumulative history of abuse, abuse during both childhood and adulthood, reported the side effects the most. And trauma may also drive the need for treatment. So we also explored the co-use of benzodiazepines among opioid users at the Back and Pain Center at the University of Michigan. Now, co-use of benzodiazepines and opioids, it's dangerous. Both of them can cause respiratory depression. And we found that patients reporting a history of child abuse and cumulative abuse, being both childhood and adult abuse, reported the highest rates of co-use of benzodiazepines and opioids. And trauma also changed the relationship between anxiety and co-use. So on this other figure, you can see that at high levels of anxiety, those with a history of cumulative trauma, so that's the line that's in orange that's kind of ramping up at the end, had a drastically increased probability of co-use. In fact, when anxiety was high, when they reported high anxiety, all of the patients with a history of cumulative abuse reported benzodiazepine and opioid co-use. And this point is really driven home by this work by Sturz and Campbell. So they interviewed adult rape survivors in an effort to understand prescription medication use after the rape. They found that 43% of the sample reported sedative or antidepressant use. Of these, only 42% were given medication to cope with the trauma after disclosing the rape to their physician. 58% did not disclose the assault. Yet many of the survivors acknowledged that the medication was needed to cope. So this quote that was included in the paper, I wanted some help, help to make it stop hurting. I didn't want to tell my doctor, so I, I don't know, I talked around it, you know, and he gave me something. So where do we go from here? So first, it's important to know that previous research has shown that treating trauma-related symptoms may also improve pain-related symptoms. So a comprehensive approach is really needed when there's an overlap between trauma exposure or symptoms and pain. And it's important to take a holistic approach as well. So my colleague and mentor, Dr. Afton Hassett, recently published a really great book called Chronic Pain Reset, and that provides some self-management techniques that might be useful for chronic pain. And there are also some great books that discuss the physical consequences of trauma. So I oftentimes recommend Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score. And I want to highlight the importance of these somatic body-based approaches. These types of approaches have been advocated by folks in the trauma world in order to promote a sense of safety and coherence in the physical body. So things like yoga um, might be particularly helpful. And as a social psychologist, building social connections and embracing social support is really important. And there's a really interesting field of research that's kind of emerging right now that ties the somatic approaches of synchrony, developing synchrony and movement with another individual. And that can help build trust. And it's also been shown to lower pain sensitivity. 
So working with the body in a social context might be particularly helpful. And then finally, I want to emphasize the importance of self-advocacy. No one else is in your body, and pain is not visible to anybody else. So you have to advocate for yourself, and then make sure to find those self-management approaches that help you. So in closing, I just want to say thank you for listening. I also want to thank all of the participants who have contributed to this knowledge of the association between trauma and pain, and then also to the incredible teams that I work with at the Back and Pain Center and the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center. Thank you.